Hi everyone, I am Danielle and I'm the Engagement Advisor at Engineering New Zealand. Um, so I work with students and young engineers and today we've got some awesome young engineers along to talk to you about um, their transition from study to work. Um, I'm going to pass over to Jean in a moment but I just want to let everyone know that if you have any questions we do have a Q&A function where you can type your questions in um, at any point during the conversation and then at the end um, they will go over your questions. So without further ado, over to you, Jean. Cool. Uh, cheers for that, Danielle. I think you've covered what I was planning to cover in the introduction, so that makes it easy for me. Um, yep, so welcome, everyone. Uh, we really hope you enjoy this, this little panel session that we put together. Um, so there's, there's five of us in this uh, panel. Um, I'll just give you a quick introduction of everyone that's here. Um, and in terms of just a rough agenda, we were thinking of just doing a pretty relaxed panel session type of thing. Um, and as Danielle said, we really encourage you to uh, ask questions. Um, but failing that, if there is a bit of a lull, we do have a few topics we can cover as well. So we've got you covered there. Uh, and I'll do my best as, uh, to get through as many questions as possible too. So I uh, guess I'll start. I am Gene Sams. I've studied electrical engineering at the University of Canterbury. And over the last four years or so, I've been working um, at Meridian Energy in Twizel, Christchurch, Wellington um, through their grad program. And now I've taken up a project manager role in the renewable development team. Uh, I also chair the Young Engineers in Wellington. And yeah, that's that's me. I'll now pass it on to Nathan. Hello. So I'm a young engineer-ish. I think it's under 35. Where you're classified as a young engineer and I refuse to admit that I'm I'm getting a few grey hairs. So I am uh, work in Marlborough. I'm a civil engineer, recently a chartered civil engineer. So that took a bit of effort, but I got to it in the end. Um, and yeah, work civil geotech sort of work in across Marlborough. We recently had that one in a hundred year rainfall event, which uh, hit on a Saturday in the afternoon. It was still daylight. So you could really see what was going on. There was a crazy amount of rain. And the um, result of that is that we've got years and years of work ahead and design work, and there's not many engineers in Marlborough. But I'm sure a lot of you grads, you may be brought in to Marlborough to, to, to help on some of those remedial works. Apart from that, I'm the chair for the young engineers of Nelson and Marlborough, because we're quite small regions. We kind of just combined as one, although we're about an hour and a half drive away. That pretty much sums up me. Nice. Um, Rita, how about you? Hello everyone. Um, I'm Rita. I have studied at Auckland University um, and have been working for the past two years as a civil engineer um, for WSP down in Tipotu, Dunedin. Um, it's, I, haven't, I haven't been working too long. I've been just joined the Young Engineers Committee down in Dunedin. Um, and so far I have been doing a range of work from water through to civil general through to transportation and basically getting my hands on anything that's coming my way. So yeah, welcome. Sweet. Cheers for that. How about you Kate? Could you tell us about yourself? Hello, I'm Kate Parkinson. I went to the University of Canterbury and I did chemical and process engineering. Graduated in 2017, so this is my fourth year of work. I spent my first year and a bit in Ashburton doing irrigation design, which um, was challenging, the location more so. Um, and then I moved back to Christchurch and now I work for a environmental consultancy called Paddle Dalimore Partners in their water infrastructure team. So doing three waters design, water supply, wastewater, stormwater. Um, learned a lot in the last two years, almost as much as I learned in my first year. Good stuff. Cheers for that, Kate. And last but not least, Warren, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello, yeah, so um, I'm Warren. Um, I graduated in Australia, actually, the University of Queensland, um, and then moved here um, for employment. Uh, first worked in Christchurch and then in Palmerston North. Um, I'm working as ooh, a civil and environmental engineer, but with the focus on the, the three waters and stormwater in particular design. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's uh, pretty much me. Um, oh yes, I'm the chair of the Manawatu Young Engineers. Awesome stuff. 
Uh, I see we've got a few questions that have already come in, uh, so I think this ties quite nicely into the first topic we were going to get into, um, which is uh, us telling us a little bit more about our first day and even our first week of, um, of work, of, of employment. So um, one of the questions which I think would be quite useful is, uh, what was the biggest thing you've learned in your first week? So Nathan, would you mind uh, starting us off on what we found? Yeah, yeah, not a problem. So. Um... Like most jobs, I guess, uh, when you go and you get signed a mentor and, and, and that mentor will, will show you the ropes. Uh, this mentor will also kind of guide you through your early years of your work as an engineer. Uh, my, my mentor when I started was also my boss. It was a small company. It was an older kind of near retired gray chap, but he looked in his 40s for some reason. He looked very young, um, but he had a wealth of knowledge. Uh, predominantly in structural engineering and project management. To me, he was he was the god uh, of engineering. Um, his way of kind of mentoring, mentoring me in those first sort of early stages were to give me a particular problem on a job and then give me absolutely no assistance on, on how to solve it. Um, that, in general terms, is not the way you mentor somebody. But it did teach me some very valuable lessons. It taught me to to get that problem and try and tackle it on my own. And and what I would say as a as a new sort of graduate coming in, don't be worried if you're given a problem that you don't know how to tackle it. Um, give it your best shot. Um, don't let your confidence get knocked if you get it wrong, because it's going to happen time and time again. And eventually, after a few years of experience and and, and a few grey hairs, you'll you'll be the one making the call. So my kind of tip is, is don't let your confidence get knocked and be prepared to make mistakes because they happen. You know, I've made one this morning already. Over yeah, to you. Yeah, no, that, that's very insightful. Um, I think something that I, I learned quite early on in my, um, both my internship and grad program in, in Twizel was um, ask the stupid questions early, it's as fine. soon as you can, as many as you can. That's, that's, um, that's probably my biggest tip for the first, not even the first week, I'd say the first year, just ask all, all the stupid questions. Yep. Yeah. How, how about you, Kate? Any insight from your first, your first week or your first uh, day even? Yeah, I felt like I didn't know anything in my first week and I thought that everyone around me knew everything. And yeah, I was the same as you, Nathan. I had a few um, times when I was dropped in it by my uh, supervisor or my manager with not a lot of guidance. Um, that's how some people learn. That's cool. But yeah, asking a lot of questions, none of them are stupid questions. Half of the time, the grads ask me a question and ask them another answer. Like the people around you are just as much learning still as you are. So ask the questions for sure. Very good. How about you, Warren? Do you have any tips for your first day? Or Yeah, I guess, um, well, first day, first week, it's more like the first month or the stuff. Um, but yeah, on that um, note, um, understanding that the people who are there who are there longer than you don't necessarily know how to do the engineering work. And I'm not saying that they're bad engineers or anything like that. It's just that the complexity of the work is such that you cannot store all the information in your head and you cannot learn it over the course of five years. Um, I'm still learning and I have been working for five years and I'm just starting to get the hang of um, my stuff now. Um, but one of the, the key differences, I guess, between university and actually in the workplace is that rather than using textbooks or mathematic equations and that to solve problems, um, I find that in the, and you still use some math in that, but a lot of it is based on the council plans and standards and tables and lookup tables and all that. Um, understanding the mathematics is still really important to conceptualize, does this make sense? But a lot of it is based on what that particular council wants to happen. And so it's finding those documents and each council has its own one. <laughs> so look out for them. Um, you're looking for the key words there, which is like district plan and engineering standards. Uh, search that with a council to find them. Um, just that's a very valuable hint. Mm -hmm. Very good. So I'm just um, I'm just thinking back to that first first week as well. Um, I think uh, it was quite different personally for me, um, especially moving away from university where your hours are just crazy. I'm not, 
I'm sure a lot of you would agree, unless you had a strict nine to five um, routine at university as well, it was pretty erratic. So uh, the routine was definitely something that I um, definitely appreciated. Um, but yeah, it, there are some pretty stark dis um, differences that you'll find in your first um, wee while uh, working. And I think someone asked a really good question. Um, I've had no experience dealing with clients, only other students and academics. How different is it? So Rita, you're at WSP, a big consultancy, maybe you yeah. can... <laughs> I can I can try and give my two cents on that. Um, the difference with the clients, I guess, you have to you have to treat them. Uh, if any of you have worked in hospitality, that's probably the easiest uh, uh, interaction. Um, if you've worked in hospitality during uni, where it's the the customer is always right. In saying that, uh, your client might have a very certain idea of what they want. It is your job as the engineer to try and give them what they're wanting, but also providing them information on what can and can't happen. Some You'll have some clients that are very, um, have already decided with no technical background that they want this and they want it a very particular way. And you have to use your professionalism um, to go, well, okay, yeah, now I see, I see what you're, what you're wanting. Um, maybe we could try and uh, do it in this way so that we can um, provide you know, a good a good result where you're happy, but also it's going to um, what would the word be? It it's going to be realistic uh, in some terms. Um, you'll also find clients that uh, they want bang for their buck as well, so they'll want something uh, a very very high um, very high standard for not a lot of value. So basically, you're there to be the um to make sure they're always happy but they're realistic shift so uh difference you can you can still have a have a laugh and things with your client like you would with your co-workers and things like that but you still have to be aware that um they are paying you so if you have a manager you're always going to talk to them with a uh being a little bit more aware of how you're speaking um, and I'd say that that's kind of how I treat it, if that makes sense. Does that make sense, Jane? Yeah, no, that's really good. I think that's a really good analogy as well in terms of dealing with clients and um, having that being similar to, to a retail type of setting. Yeah. But it's, it's um, really good. What about you, Warren? <laughs> well, yeah, just have a quick mention that um, you're not going to be expected to talk to clients by yourself yeah. in your first like oh, year no. or two. Yeah. So don't worry <laughs> about that. You will be <laughs> with true. someone. They will not send you out alone. Yeah, you um, pick up on things from yeah, your manager yeah. and the people that you're with, yeah. Yeah, so don't worry about going alone. That's that's for much future things. Um, yeah, but thank you. But <laughs> you can still learn those skills. Um, and I like the um, the scenario with hospitality. You can consider it like the customer wants a piece of bread. The customer does not know how the bread is made, what ingredients are needed for the bread. That's the information that you need to provide and say, actually, we don't physically have this type of flour, so we can't probably want this one here especially because it lasts longer but yeah very good yep nice are you saying something as well okay oh. uh yeah just what warren said about how you're not going to be on your own in the first yeah couple of years there's always going to be someone else with you i was at a um a tent i'm going to say meeting with a council and i had my manager there to begin with he was going, this was like a few years into my career, he was going to give me the experience to run the meeting. But kind of as soon as it went a little bit off track and was getting tense, he took over. We talked about it afterwards, um, how he was wording things, how he was letting the client do more of the talking so we could get more information. Um, and I took a lot of like good learnings from that just by watching how he dealt with it. So yeah, in your first couple of years, you're just going to want to be watching how your seniors around you are talking to clients and you'll pick up on it. It's, it will come naturally eventually. That's quite yeah. good. And I'll, Oops, I'd like to just add to that if that's all good. Re really good responses, but they're, um, they're not going to expect you to um, obviously go out on your own. That's kind of what you were saying. But if you do find yourself get um, asked a question by a client, you know, you're, 
you're alone and like clients come up and they ask you a question, there's no harm in saying, taking some notes and saying, I'll check with my senior engineer and I'll, I'll get back to you on this day or, or later on today. That's a perfectly acceptable response and they'll appreciate that as that opposed happens. to feeling like, yeah, yeah, I think that'd be okay. Yep, yep, yep. That just uh, just so take that pipe out <laughs> the ground. Don't say that. Just take notes and, and communicate that to the manager. And I still do that, especially if they want a decision there and then. And I'm not quite comfortable making that. I might just go, I'll, I'll chew the fat with the manager or, or I'll, um, I'll check the designs when I'm back in the office. It gives me a bit more thinking time. Nice. Definitely. Yeah, I'd, I've um, been doing some site visits recently and you're getting, uh, I've been by myself, it's a small project, but I've been by myself with the client, the contractor and the subcontractor. And there's been something that isn't quite to the design or something that doesn't look right. Um, and then they'll all three will look at me and go, okay, so how can we fix it? Mm-hmm. And so then I just have to be confident in myself to just be able to say, um, I honestly can't give you a response right now, but as soon as I get back to the office, I'll discuss this with my seniors just to make sure that we've come up with a good solution for you. And then I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Yep. And that's absolutely okay. Yep. You have no obligation to answer there and then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So just um, just going back to the first um, sort of week, was a buddy system implemented in all your places of work? Is that quite a common thing? Or how, how did your first few relationships really come up? So I know Nathan talked about his um, boss slash mentor, which is quite good. But um, how about you, Warren, Kate, and, and Rita? Was there a system in place that you found in your grad programs or how did that work? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, not at my first job. So my first job was a smaller company and I had a supervisor, but, and he was kind of like my buddy, I guess, but he was kind of quite busy. He showed me the ropes a little bit and then gave me some reading. But at my second job, the one that I'm at now, um, we implement a buddy system where they're usually someone more your peer level. So I had someone who was the same year as me at uni. Um, He was my buddy. He showed me the ropes. He gave me um, all of the information that I needed at the beginning, like the procedures and um, how the office works and who to talk to. Um, And I think, yeah, it was really good. I know that having a manager run you through things, like, is nice because they're going to be your boss, but it's nice to see it from, like, your peers' point of view, and then that helps you make friendships. And, yeah, it was really good. Mm-hmm. How about you, Warren or Rita? Do you have anything to add to that? Um, pretty m- like I didn't have any of those sort of things going on. Um, so can't comment on that really. Um, but I do understand, like, there is definitely value in talking to someone at your own level because there's definite hesitancy in talking to someone who's more senior and more busy about the small things that you just need to run and do your job. Yeah, I think at bigger consultancies like WSP, um, they have these things set in place. So they've they've gone through because it's quite a large um, network of employees. They kind of have learnt that uh, the easiest way to deal with it is to provide you with a buddy. So I had a, a intermediate engineer was my buddy when I first came in, who was in my team. But my team in Dunedin is only twelve. Uh, our office is only 50 you know so it's still it's still quite a small office um but the the best thing that I did the the buddy was there to help me with you know the systems how to do your timesheet all those kind of things best thing that I did though was find the people that were going for a coffee walk at 10 o'clock every day um two years on and I'm still going on that same 10 o'clock coffee walk um and so they were you know, we leave the office at 10, we chat about, might be work-related things, might be personal things, whatever, just to get out of the office and go for it. And I think that was, you know, that's how we created a little bit more personal connections with each other. And so then I didn't have to just rely on my buddy. I now have, well, my whole team, but, you know, that was a solid 10 people in the office that go for that walk. So then you can talk to them about what they're doing and yeah, that was, yeah, that was my best way of creating connections, I guess. Really good. Did you have to relocate for work as well, Rita? 
Uh, yes, uh, from from Auckland, I did. Um, <laughs> but that was that was fine. It's quite nice being down here. <laughs> How did, how did you find the move in terms of um, you know, building up new relationships and well, uh, it's, um, it's a little bit easier. So I um, I went to boarding school in Dunedin. So I still managed to have a few friends that were still um, hanging around uh, from high school days. Um, they'd studied in Otago. So I still had a couple of people there. Um, but I've actually been doing a course at Te Wānanga or Aotearoa. So I've met a few, few people through that uh, those courses. I've done tikanga and um, toy arts. Um, so basically finding little hobbies or courses or sports um, was a way of kind of meeting new people that, especially when there's only like two or three friends that are left, um, just to make those connections. So yeah, I definitely recommend if you're if you're moving cities, definitely do a evening course to meet people or join a random sports team or something um, that you can find because that's great. It's really important to create networks outside of work as well. As someone who didn't do that in their first year, I can also highly recommend doing that in your first year. Um, it's really not a good idea to just wait for people to come and meet you and talk to you and hope that sometimes it changes you really 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 do need to go out um, and meet people and join clubs and do the things that you need to do to meet people it's really scary um, but and I'm sure everyone here on the young engineers committees will be like just give us an email or we can hang out with some time I mean certainly I would be keen um, but seriously, push yourself to do this when you move. And don't wait like a month or half a year. Just do it like as soon as you physically can. Yeah, nice. How did you find your move, Nathan? Coming all the way from London, it must have been quite a big change. Yeah, so originally from London, uh, my Kiwi mates still think I sound really English. My partner and my friends back home think I sound Australian or, or even <laughs> Kiwi. They can't differentiate between the two um hey i've always traveled around and um i think i didn't expect to end up in new zealand and although cultures are quite similar i find uh, between the uk and, and and new zealand so the, the adjustment was wasn't too challenging uh the lingo was was difficult you know like you yeah now you're on site you're saying yeah now yeah now and um whatever we call them soak aways um, in the UK, here they call them soap pits. But whenever I say soak away, it's the most hilarious thing. And Kiwis are like, what is that? But yeah, I've, I'd say now half of my working life has been in New Zealand. So, and half my adult life, you know, the important years. So I feel, I feel like a lot of my time is now, you know, I'm embedded in this culture. Mm -hmm. oh, and you. just go out and meet people, join CrossFit, and then you'll meet loads of people. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I see that um, we've had a whole bunch of questions come through in the last few minutes. Um, let's see if we can do one of these now. So, uh, so one of the attendees has asked, I really like the technical aspects, but I'm worried about talking to other engineers and clients. Do you have any suggestions? Yep. For that. Go for Nathan. Um, Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. If um, anyone else. Yeah. Communication is absolute vital. Um, if you've got a problem and you don't really know what the problem is, but you need to communicate, you need help on that problem. That can be really difficult to do because you don't know the terminologies and that. The thing that I learned a few years ago that really helped with my communication, because now that I'm sometimes in meetings with with clients, cancel other engineers, and they're all interrogating you, they can be feel like you're under 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 the spotlight a bit like a, um, what do they call it? When you're with the headlight, the, oh, whatever. Yeah, Off when you're me. moonlighting, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so communi communicating your problem and, and being able to debate and evaluate and do all those sort of skills are really important. And one way to do that would be to join your local uh, Toastmasters. There you learn how to um, speak in public. And when you are when you are in a meeting, with free people, you're essentially public speaking, especially if you're trying to persuade them um, of, of your design, you're trying to persuade them, get them on your side, why your design's gonna work and why you, you're trying to sell something. 
So Toastmasters is a good, effective place to do that because you're around other like-minded people. So it doesn't matter if you make mistakes. That's what Toastmasters is for. So I've recently joined that and I found it quite fun because you can have a debate with somebody in like kind of a fun environment so that when you go into the real world and you have a debate, you've got some tactics and that sort of stuff. And it will really improve your communication skills, I think. So that's that's probably one of my top tips. I can second that, yeah. It's a really good suggestion. Yeah. I was also going to say, don't leave the communication to the last minute. So if you do have also, questions, if yes. you realize that you do not know the answer, even though it might stress you out a little bit that you have to admit that you have no clue what's going on, don't procrastinate from it. Just straight away, just go to whoever you can, someone above you, and just go, I need help on this. Um, I don't know what I'm what I'm doing or where I can find the answer. Um, so that would be that is a really good tip. Top tip on that one. If I can just mention uh, something else, though, if you're just leaving uh, university, uh, your technical skills are rather good, but the technical skills aren't use. They aren't perfect. Um, in my experience, the technical skills that you learn at university aren't directly applicable to the work that you'll be doing. Um, so what I just want to mention is don't think that you know everything when you're leaving university. You don't, not even close, but you do have the basic skill set to actually work as an engineer, but you do not know everything. So you do need to communicate with um, other people in your team and your mentors, and you need to be okay with being wrong. That's really important. You need to be okay with being wrong. They also won't expect you to know everything either. <laughs> mm -hmm. They do understand that you're coming from university and that you might have forgotten everything. You just studied a transport paper in first semester of the previous year. They're 100% going to be absolutely okay if you can't remember anything that, that has shifted out of your brain because you're yeah. going to probably learn majority of it on the job. Um, or at least that was my experience. No one expected me um, to know everything. And exactly, Warren's 100% right. You have to be okay with being wrong. Um, yeah. You're going to be wrong at times, um, but you yeah. need to use that to, to learn. That's how we learn. So. But is another thing though is don't just automatically go to your boss or your peers to ask any silly question um have a quick search and see if you can find anything first and have a quick read through but if it's any longer than an hour then go and ask but you don't want to be irritating everyone by asking questions which were so easy to find out just as a warning but give yourself some time and then go and ask is essentially that mm -hmm. very good at least i can say from um Having not worked on the consultancy side, but more on the client side, um, when you when you're talking to consultants, you definitely want them to be confident, at least show confidence. So um, I think it pays to not argue with you know the person you're sitting in meetings with. Maybe your your supervisors. Um, I think we've <laughs> we've seen it go wrong a few times, but generally uh, you, you don't want to ask a client for information a second time or things that you should already know that's been provided to you. You don't really want to go back. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's quite important that the, I think you'll, you'll find that, uh, they take the reputation of the company quite, quite seriously. Uh, Cause that's, yeah, as you'd expect, that's quite important. So at least from the client side, that's something that we look at and work with many, many consultants now. Uh, so yeah, confidence is key, but of course it's something that can be learned as well. Mm. That goes back to Toastmasters. That was a great tip. Yeah, I found it really beneficial, um, especially because a good engineer is someone that can persuade others and and also um, communicate problems and and solutions. Well, sometimes you've got a good solution, but if you can't tell the person in the solution in layman terms, then it's not a lot of help. So, you know, there's loads of tips there. And, and it's, a, it's a fun, very low cost way of doing it. And it's stuff that university or... NMIT, whatever, um, or college, it, it won't, they won't teach you those skills. And that's a whole other aspect. Nice. So we've got another really good question here from Jaden. Um, he's asking, is it more ideal for new employees to learn the software used in the industry before getting the job? 
as in does it add more value to my skills and qualifications when applying for the job or preparing to adapt to the uh, job tasks? Can you answer that one? Um, it's as I've done a lot of stuff with different software, I can say that yes, it will, but learning the software is a big ask. Like it will take you way longer than you think to actually learn a piece of software and the best way to learn is actually having a project in order to motivate you. Um, you can only run through the tutorials so many times and like I've learned a lot, but each one has taken so many hours to learn. And I'm not just talking like 30 to 40 hours, I'm talking weeks, right? So while it may give you some skills, you need to be aware that you've only got the basic skills in that software if you're learning them in university. Um, and that it will take a lot of time and a lot of experience to actually build up the expertise in that, um, which I'm, again, the people employing you will understand. Yes. I think especially at um, grad intern level as well, um, when you're going in at this stage, uh, AutoCAD is a very, uh, especially in civil, is a, yeah, is a massively used uh, software. Yeah, if you could, like, uh... And there's so many, so many levels to it. Um, and unless you are using it constantly and doing multiple projects back to back so you can um, solidify your knowledge of what you've just learned, like having to make a stormwater profile or something like that, it's very, it's very easy to forget. And, um, and you're not going to be expected to, to learn all of that. But it, I mean, if you're interested in learning it, by no means uh, will hurt you in any way, but um, it's not a requirement. Mm. Yeah, I think like the basics can help. Yeah, if you've got an interest in it or you've done it at uni, then that can help. But you're going to yeah learn the ins and outs of it when you're on a project. So I would say it's like the the detailed learning of software for when you're at the job. Yeah, well said. And of course, there's an opportunity cost to you using that time studying when you could be learning it on the job, right? So, yeah, um, not very good. So this is quite a good question. I quite like this one. Uh, what surprised you all when uh, you first started work? Very good. Warren, go for it, Warren. Sorry, I'm too keen, I guess. Um, most people don't have very good organizational systems. Uh, council plans are you know, sometimes incomplete, so don't rely on them um sometimes you need to look for other information based on other plans like i just you assume i assumed that everything was nicely organized when i started in the workforce it's not um it's really not and it's a lot of assumptions that have been made and that that aren't true so that's the other reason why questioning things is really important because i have found like proper documents that are incorrect that just don't make sense um, so questioning that with your um, superior or even, yeah, well, the manager first um, is definitely valuable because, yeah, it's, sometimes, it's not clear. Um, oh, sorry, I've got one more, which is just good. There's a thing called projections and uh, vertical datums, which you use for spatial positioning of civil sites. Um, those are the two um, search keys that you can look for. Um, <laughs> it's not just all based on mean sea level. Just, just so you know, that was something I didn't learn through four years, and even the first year of my actual work. So, yeah, it was helpful to know. Cool. How about you, Kate? Do you have any? What, do you, what did you find was the most? Um, what surprised you most when you Surprising. I still just I, it surprises me all the time that the people that are my seniors don't know everything. <laughs> like I just still assume, and then still like and proved wrong that they they're still learning and they're still like you might know more than them in some cases like if you've just studied a paper at university on it you're probably going to know how to do that better than they do if they haven't worked on a project like I had a I had a grad ask me a question and I went like honestly you're gonna know way more than me on that so that was surprising and yeah continues to surprise me <laughs> how about you Rita I'm just trying to think of something that surprised me. I, I think it's, I think it's the same. Ah, oh, how many reports is in engineering? Um, I was told that there'd be a fair few. I didn't quite realise how many. 
Um, so uh, that that can be a challenge, especially for someone who was never very strong with um, report writing in English. Um, I was, you know, sold with the maths and problem solving and didn't realise I'd have to uh, communicate it out by uh, written language. Um, so that's another communication tool as well, being able to, and also uh, another handy note is that being aware of who you are writing the report for. So um, you might have some really technical stuff, but you're handing it over to a client that um, might know a few words of jargon, but doesn't really understand. So you have to be quite careful with how you read it to make sure that they know what's going on. Um, but I think that was the most surprising was how many reports I've written over a two year period. Um, not very exciting, but, <laughs> but yeah. Cool. I think that. Nice. What about you, Nathan? Um, I think probably the one for me is how difficult and challenging it was to spend eight hours at your desk sometimes especially early on with not a lot of work on your plate or deadlines and then spend those eight hours awake was was one of the biggest challenges for me and like I've noticed that now like I've adapted to it I've evolved I'm fine at sitting down because eight hours a day sat, sat at the desk like that I'm fine but I see grads that come in now and they're nodding off in the early afternoon because it's something that you, you, you wouldn't have done before. You wouldn't have spent eight hours, five days a week, sat at your desk looking at a screen. And if you haven't got any mental stimulation, you, you may find it quite challenging. So I would just say that if you are falling asleep or feel like you're tired, it's totally fine. That's it's going to happen. Get a big drink of water and, and, and that'll keep you going during the day. And then when the deadlines hit and the adrenaline's going, then you'll be more than awake. And put your hand up to go out on site so that you're not just sitting yep. at your desk. <laughs> yeah, but obviously that's for uh, work. Yeah, consultancy side is is more office based, and contractual side you may be out on site as a site engineer, um, more more surveying or, or whatever out on site managing the works. But I definitely understand the whole eight hour shift. I was definitely a night owl at um, university, so I would be working during the day. Um, part time, and then I would start my uni work probably after dinner, um, and then go through till quite late at night or the early hours of the morning. And I got really into that rhythm, um, and then coming in and having to wake up and be at the office by eight or eight thirty. It was a real <laughs> a real push at the start. Um, now it's definitely a lot easier, um, but I think. They're very right with the drink of water, get up, walk around the office, go say hi to people, go have a quick chat. That's going to wake you up more so than if you're um, feeling tired at your desk and <laughs> keeping on nodding off. Um, I've <laughs> joked multiple times about putting a mattress under my desk. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but definitely it's okay. Everyone's been in the same position. Um, just find find ways of keeping yourself awake and motivated um, and also having to work for those eight hours. If I wasn't um, motivated to work during university, I'd be like, okay, today or this afternoon isn't my time. I'll come back to it after I'm refreshed. Whereas in most offices now, um, you are, you know, your contract is for an eight hour day. So trying to make that shift of, okay, I need to get this done. I've got this deadline. I need to get better at not procrastinating um, mm. until the last minute, which was my university style, unfortunately, um, and learning how to manage yourself better. So, and if you're on, like at the moment, I'm on, on about seven to eight projects. Um, so I'm having to divvy up my time and figuring out how to divvy up that time. Um, so, yeah, learning a bit, about uh, self-management is a really good step in that process too. Nice. I think I might just um, round up that, that question as well. Um, this is not an insight that I picked up until after I left my grad program and having made friends with my old engineering managers as well. Uh, there is, uh, I guess in its crux, 
don't think a task is beneath you. So even if you've been given a little task, you're still going to be watched very closely, especially if you're an intern or a graduate. Um, and based on how well you can, you know, complete that small task or maybe less important tasks, your workload will increase. Your, um, I guess, your reach increases proportionally too. So uh, yeah, pay attention and do it well. But yeah, I'm sure you'll, I'm sure you all do well. And you can always ask the administration people if they need a hand as well. Even if it's scanning documents, they will be very grateful because they've got a lot more on their plate than they let on. Um, and they can be a major help. Nine times out of 10, if you have a problem in your office, your admin team is going to be there to help you. So help them when, if no one else has any technical work that um, you can help with, go and ask your admin or your HR or someone. And they yeah. also, they'll be super appreciative that you're asking them as well. That, um, so don't forget about them. Sorry. Oh, um, okay. That is uh, something that I guess you're going to have to be aware of is there's going to be times when you have no work. And it's, for me at least, it was horrible. Um, but I guess finding out where there's level between you don't have work because there isn't anything there kind of got to the point where it's a bit too much for me. It's the reason why I changed my job actually. Um, because it's just mind numbing sometimes when you don't have work, but that is going to be your experience for like the first few months. You're going to have time off that you've just not got stuff to do. So that's actually a good time for you to train on software as well. Nice. Sweet. Um, so I'm just keeping an eye on the time. I've been told that we've got just about five minutes left. So uh, yeah. we've got a question here that has got two upvotes on it. Um, and yeah, I've, I've purposely left this for last because it's quite a broad topic. Um, so maybe if we can get some quick fire answers from the team, we can um, hopefully give some good insight. So the question is, how did you get your job? Was it from your internship or did you have to apply for lots of jobs? And how did you meet people? I'm going to start with you, Nathan, on this one. Okay. Uh, I'll try to keep it short because we'll try to get through these questions. So I, when I started my career, it also happened to coincide with the, uh, one of the worst global financial disasters in recent times. So it's around a 2010 sort of mark. Jobs were very rare at that point. And uh, my lecturer told us that getting a job would be almost impossible, but to hang in there and eventually get a job. Before that, I had no experience, engineering experience. Every graduate that where there was a job, it, they needed like 10 years experience, a graduate 10 years experience doesn't exist. So my experience was I used to dress up as a mouse and, and dance at children's birthday parties. So I had no experience, relevant experience anyway. But what I did have and what got me the job was my passion and enthusiasm. When I, I knew someone in the workplace who was a friend of a sister, one of my sister's best friends, so I had a link, I got a key. And nowadays you can use LinkedIn to get those sort of networks and, and, and chatting to get on LinkedIn and do that. If you know someone in there, it makes it a little bit easier. And if you do get your foot in the door for an interview, go in there with passion, enthusiasm, especially if you haven't got any experience apart from dressing up as a mouse. There you go. Nice. No, that's really good. How about you, Warren? Um, so for me, I didn't have any connections. There was no one that I knew that did engineering. I was asking people at university, like my lecturers at university and research positions at university, if they had anything, um, which they did, though the research position was sampling cow, uh, pig feces, which wasn't quite what I wanted in mind. Um, but I applied for, and I guess my parents helped me with that, is I applied for three jobs a day minimum. Um, that was my job while I was looking for a job. Um, and I probably sent out like 150 um, different uh, CVs. Um, I had a generic one set up for jobs that looked promising, but weren't like especially interesting to me. And then I'd specifically spend like a time a day on a one particular job application, which really interested me. Um, but yeah, it's really hard. Uh, just keep at it. Um, I was going through the yellow pages. So just, just keep that in mind. Nice. Yep. That's really good. And um, I quite like the idea of, you know, just applying for a certain amount of jobs per, jobs per day and that sort of having a compounding effect as well. Um, that's really good. What do you, what about you, Kate? What do you, what do you reckon? Well, my first job, um, I think it was at the careers fair at university that they do at UC. Um, I saw the company there 
um, I thought that I ticked a few of my boxes and I applied for it and they liked my, I guess, we had a good interview. I somehow got to the first stage and we had a good interview and that was probably what sold it then rather than the CV or the, um, the cover letter. Also, cover letter is important. Um, but my second job, um, it was actually more from who I knew. So I was I was on the state, like same track as Warren. I didn't like the job I was in. I was applying for tens of jobs every week. Um, but this one was because I knew someone who worked at the company. So keep in touch um, with everyone because New Zealand is a very small place. And they had said that there was this job coming up. They thought maybe I could um, I could fit the criteria. And it was actually for an agricultural scientist job. I'm not an agricultural scientist. And I used all of like the key words out of the job advert in my cover letter and in my CV. And I somehow got an interview. And <laughs> they asked me what I knew about farm systems. And I didn't really know anything. Um, but they liked my CV. They liked my skills. They knew that I'd done the same degree as someone else who had worked there. And so they actually created a job for me. So sometimes you've just got to get your foot in the door and then show them what you've got and pull up from there. Nice. That's really cool. It's really, really cool. Um, how about you, Rita? I think I'll pass. Um, no, sorry. Yeah. Is that you, Nathan? Oh, yeah, I was just going to just add on to that. Then once you get your foot in the door and you get your first job, it's downhill from there. Everyone will want you. Once you get one, two years experience, engineering, we're lucky. It's hugely in demand in, in New Zealand and uh, the world's your oyster here at the moment. Hopefully it will continue like that. Just got to get your fir- foot in the door somehow, kick it down, get in there. Completely agree with that. Definitely helps to have a LinkedIn as well that you've um, spent a little bit of time on. So And a, a good photograph. Work. Yeah, that's yeah. so many people have <laughs> yeah drunken nights out photographs and you know you gotta look look semi professional. Make your Facebook private. Yep. <laughs> yes. And Remember your the com- yeah. companies may charge you out at one hundred to two hundred dollars an hour when you first get in. So you know you need to kind of at least look the part or or, or be professional at that. Especially if you're uh, the cli- you're on the client's end and you're paying two three hundred dollars for someone to come help you for an hour and and they turn up in uh, gym gear, it's kind of oh yeah, kind of that wear aspect. nice clothing, yeah, definitely. Like always, go on the most formal side of formal, like <laughs> bow tie. <laughs> Maybe not that far, <laughs> but like wear nice clothing. Like always, yeah. try and. Because if you're overdressed, that's not nearly as bad as being underdressed. You will feel so self-conscious if you're not like dressed in a t-shirt and everyone else is in proper college shirts or blouses. Let me see the seed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, do you have anything to add to that, Maria? Um, I was a bit lucky. I got mine through my internship with WSP in Auckland and I was offered a role in the Auckland office and I asked to be transferred down to Dunedin. Um but to get my internship, I didn't, I did apply for it, but I actually got it through going to WSP, came to the university and held a questionnaire day um, presentation, I guess. Um, and I found there was a, a woman there that had become a team leader within four years. So I was basically just pumping her with questions after they finished their presentation. Um, and then I got her email and I was still asking her questions afterwards. And then I struggled to find the internship where to post my um, CV and my cover letter. So I emailed her and said, hey, can you please pass me on to someone um, that can help me with this? 100, Warren, 100%, I couldn't do it. I didn't know where it was. Um, I couldn't find it. And she goes, oh, yeah, I'll pass you on to HR. This is the lady that was actually at the presentation as well. And the lady came back to me and said, oh, um, you've, you've missed the deadline um, because we didn't respond quick enough to you. Sorry about that. But I'll pass your CV on to the appropriate managers and I'll get you an interview. So I was extremely lucky in that regard that me making that connection, people, if they have a face to a name when they're reading your CV and you had a conversation with them, they'll remember that and you might, it, it definitely helped me in my case anyway. Um, and so I had a good interview. I was cut short on my interview because the person before me had taken over an hour and a quarter. So I got cut down to 45 minutes. 
And I was terrified. I was like, oh, my God, they cut me short. Obviously, that didn't go very well. It was only a conversation. We were talking about how the lady was designing her new house. We didn't talk anything. I think I got two actual interview questions in there somehow. And I was like, oh, gosh, it's gone all wrong. Um, um, you know, I'm going to have to look somewhere else. And then uh, two days later, I got an email saying that I'd been accepted. So, but yeah, <laughs> conversations, communication, uh, and making those connections where you can. Um, I found a lot more beneficial uh, than when I was, like Warren, I'd previously been sending through a whole bunch of CVs and stuff, and it hadn't been working in my favor. So I took a different tact. Uh, also, uh, with the cover letters, Yes, Kate, they are super important. Be super careful that you have spelt the company correctly, um, which sounds funny, but uh, for me who started out in my first year uni, I wrote down Fulton and Hogan um, when I was trying to apply for there. So obviously you see that if you get that cover letter, you're, you've gone, well, they haven't done their research. Mm. Move across because they're going to get a pile. Um, so yeah. Double check spelling. <laughs> I'd also recommend making it look nice as well because you're going to, if you, it just looks like a text document, basic text document, it's not going to look great. Um, try and make yours unique and stand out just by looking at it. Um, but yeah, 100% can support Rita on the um, those connections and that like emailing people that you know. Uh, my first interview I got uh, was for a concrete factory and I like sent in my application and then I phoned them up and said, so I've just applied for this job. I don't care if I don't get it. Can I have a look at your factory? That's how I got my interview um, uh -huh. because I was just so enthusiastic. And that's the key is you need to be genuinely enthusiastic about like when you're doing it and they will pick up on it. And even if it's a short interview, they will pick up on that conversation and that you're actually really interested and that you're willing to learn and all that. But yeah, um, sometimes phoning up and saying, can I have a look at this cool thing that you've got? Um, I actually might give you that interview. Yes, that's a good tactic. Think, um, yeah, as, as cheesy as it sounds, your, your network is so important. And um, this may sound like a plug, but Engineering New Zealand genuinely has good opportunities for you to go out and meet engineers like us, for example, that are always keen for a bit of a chat. Um, we can give you, you know, down low of what it's really like working in working in industry and the good thing is like once you you i mean new zealand's pretty small and you generally just end up meeting the same people again and again even if they're outside of your core discipline so highly recommend going to networking events and especially if they're engineering new zealand ones and um i, I realize that like i purposely left this question to last because i know we could go on and on about a different t um tips and tricks and you know um the like but uh Engineering New Zealand does have specific targeted events for these um, these types of questions. So, for example, we'd have like CV skills, um, interview skills, or how to build your personal brand, how to network, these types of things. Um, and each of these tend to be around an hour, and hour to an hour and a half each. Um, so it's not something we could really answer in 10 minutes. But um, yeah, so keep an eye out for those. And obviously it's going to vary with, uh, uh, with your region. Yeah, we're starting to see a lot more webinars now too, so it'd be good if you keep uh, keep coming to these. Yeah, so um, I think we have time for one last question, and it's another good one from Jaden here. So um, do we have maybe this? Yeah, maybe this could be a quick fire one, but um, do we have any more specific tips on how we can prepare for workplace mindset other than joining networking activities, practicing communication with family, friends, and classmates? So any specific tips on how we can prepare for the workplace mindset seems to be the core question. Who wants to start with that? Me again? I would. No, oh, yeah, go for it. No, someone else. Oh. <laughs> go for it, Kate. I was going to say that if you've, got, um, like if you've got time before you start working and like Rita was saying, how to get up in the morning, try and get that routine set. Like start getting ready to get up at 7 or 7.30 or whatever it is so that you're ready for your day as you would be when you start working. So it's not such a shock that comes around. Because even like you have holidays, you should sleep in for a while, you get way out of your routine. But routine is kind of key when it comes to work. And like Nathan's been saying, like with the eight hours a day, you've got to get into that sort of mindset. And it's, if you can do it when you've got time to fail, then I would, I'd give that a go. Nice. Did you want to say something to that as well, Warren? Um, always try and arrive early on your first day. 
um, the traffic is always unexpected. Um, so yeah, it's always good to just try and arrive early on your first day. Um, the other thing I would recommend everyone getting a log book or just like a big notebook that you use specifically to write down um, both like the projects you're working on. So you can write down your little notes and things that you need to do on a project or like different things and possibly some calculations if you wanted to, but also like your meeting minutes and your learnings and your experience, because that is really useful to keep a record of um, going forward. Um, so buy like a hardcover logbook. Um, do I actually have one around me? Oh, give me a second, I'll bring one. it up. <laughs> oh, yeah, something like that. Really, really should get one of there those. There you go. That's exactly what I've done. And I have, I think I've filled out a solid five or I have different ones for different areas because I've been working in so many different places and projects um, that, so if I have questions on water, I go, okay, my water project, I wrote everything from the last one, my lessons learned, I wrote that in this one. I'll go through, I think I wrote something about that. Um, but yeah, 100% with Warren on that one. Mm. Write down stuff. Yeah, that's really good tip. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've personally just moved away from the notebooks itself, but I can get away with it. I've moved to OneNote, so. Yeah, I've done Same that thing. too, actually. Yeah. That's a tip from me. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Nathan? Anything to add in terms of um, setting up your workplace mindset? Uh, Toastmasters. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, I think that's one good tool, you know, especially if you're potentially get a bit of uh, anxiety when you're in public speaking uh, or, or when you've got to ask questions uh, or, or don't know, sometimes you, you know the question, but you can't say the question, you know, you don't know how to put it into words or especially when there's four people looking at you. So just go Toastmasters or, 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 or something like that to practice in that environment as opposed to trying to practice in your work environment and spend 10, 15 years not really... Um, develop him. Um, that's well, probably my, my top to Young Engineers events. Young Engineers yeah. events. <laughs> uh, jo join the committee, Young Engineers committee. Literally, like, every committee in every region would be happy with, with new members or or joining on board or going to the events and meeting people. Um, it's a great way to figure out what kind of job you're wanting as well. Like, for yeah. civil, you're going to have contract, like, I've... Mm. I met a lot of people that were in contracting or on the client side like Jane or that were in consultancy. And from that, because I didn't get experience in all three areas, because I went straight from internship to grad role, mm -hmm. um, that was that was my way of being like, okay, like I've heard from people working in these places. I think that I am pretty happy in this role that I'm currently in. Um, and that's, that's from meeting people that are in the workplace, which is what you get from... Uh, engineering New Zealand events. And it's um, it's so handy knowing these people in different sectors and different fields. Marlborough, we're quite a small region. So I know a lot of people because they go to my gym or whatever at, at Marlborough Council. And if I need something or I've got a question, it's a lot easier to ring someone up that you you know, maybe not on a real personal level, but you you know of them, you've been to events with them or whatever. It makes it a lot easier to get the information you want and get the result basically i mean it's and, and vice versa you know they've got engineering queries they might come to us so it's just building up that network of, of um, other professionals um i would also like to mention that we are not special um or at least i'm not um i uh well for example um i'm not a great a student like a is not my thing it took me five years to do the degree i'm willing to just come out and say that so don't feel as if you're not good enough to join the committee um again it's it's a great learning experience to even actually improve and it's also really good on your resume um but you learn those skills you don't have to be special or the smartest person to join these committees just hang out and have fun and that's what we're trying to do really and that's, that's the main thing yeah yeah same with jobs as well they're not looking, they're not necessarily looking for, they might be looking for A plus students, you know, but there's a lot more companies are also wanting a good variety. So, um, so you're not at a loss if you're not getting the grades that you were thinking in your mind that companies are wanting. They're looking at a whole, a whole image and making sure that you fit in with their team and their, um, their outlook and their morals and everything as well. So uh, 
you'll you'll get through it you'll get there you'll get a job you'll be okay um and also to add on to warren's being early to a job try and be like five to ten minutes early i'd say this because on my first day i was like 15 minutes early and i was kind of awkwardly walking around trying to not get there too early so i was just stressing myself out more um if you live in a city go and sit in a cafe go even if you're wanting to be like an an hour early if you really need that time go find a cafe go get yourself a coffee sit down relax and then head in 10 yeah. minutes early you'll be fine yeah, you'll be, fine. be absolutely okay <laughs> are, we, are we about to get thrown off danielle I call it throwing off but um <laughs> <laughs> We might wrap it up here. Uh, huge thank you to you guys for coming along and sharing um, your advice from your huge wealth of knowledge. Really appreciate it. And for everyone who's been listening, um, we will be posting the recording on our YouTube channel and sharing on our social media, as well as sending the link to um, everyone who registered for the event. So if you want to listen again or catch up on something that you missed, it'll be available. Um, yeah, that's concludes our webinar for today. So thank you guys.